You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Company news stories of the day topical is Netflix. It has acquired the exclusive rights to Raw as well as other programming from World Wrestling Entertainment, marking the streaming service's first big move into live events. The streaming giant, Big Bucks here, has agreed to pay $5 billion over the course of the 10-year deal. Let's break this down with Geetha Ranganathan. She covers all the media stuff for Bloomberg Intelligence. She joins us via Zoom from the Bloomberg Intelligence headquarters in lovely Princeton, New Jersey. Geetha, this is a big move for Netflix here because they've kind of resisted getting into live events and sports and that that kind of stuff. So what gives here? Yeah, uh, what gives, I think, Paul, is advertising. So they resisted advertising, too, for the longest time till they were kind of finally forced to bite the bullet and, and use advertising to kind of uh, reinvigorate subscriber growth. And so far, I mean, it's worked, uh, maybe not as much as they had hoped it would, which is why they kind of need to do, they need to invest in their business in order to kind of really build that critical mass of, you know, ad supported users that, you know, then they can sell kind of advertising to. And so I think this is really the, the, the real uh, play here for Netflix is is to, to chase those advertising dollars. How, how much could it actually help? Like, what kind of numbers are we looking at? Like X amount of its revenue now that could be X amount in five years? Right now, the revenue is, is de minimis, right? Uh, you know, they, they launched the advertising tier in November of 2022, kind of had a really, really slow start. Uh, but the most recent number that they reported was 23 million monthly active users. So we think that translates roughly to about 12 million or 13 million subscribers uh, on the ad platform. Ultimately, what we want to be able to see uh, for scale um, you know, we know that Amazon Prime is actually launching, uh, I think just in a few days, they're kind of launching video ads on, on Prime Video. And the, the, the audience right off the bat that they've kind of cited to advertisers is 115 million. Wow. So what you really kind of want to see is 50 million, 100 million. That is really kind of the captive audience, the critical mass that we're looking for. In terms of how much can advertising potentially be? So right now, Netflix is about a 35, 40 billion dollar business. I think if it takes off in a big way, probably in the next two years, I wouldn't be surprised if advertising made up about 10 to 15 percent of Netflix's revenue. Yeah, that's a lot. So, Keitha, you know, is this maybe the first step dipping the toe in the pool of maybe becoming a bigger player in sports overall? That Again, they've kind of resisted and been very adamant about they don't have an interest in sports, maybe because of the price tag. But is this maybe the first opportunity here? I definitely think so. Um, you know, so the, yes, they have spoken about the price tag. Again, this is, a, you know, definitely a hefty price tag. It's $5 billion over a span of 10 years. So they're spending 500 million a year, but again, they're not necessarily betting the farm, right? Because if, if we wanted to see Netflix do something transformative, you know, it would have to be like maybe buying a gaming studio, which would be upwards of, you know, 15, 20, $30 billion, or maybe just buying a film studio again, which would be a huge price tag. Of course, sports rights are also expensive. This kind of, I think, allows them to dip their toes a little bit. Uh, you know, it's still 500 million. It's not some crazy number like, you know, what, what, you know, uh, some of the other big media giants are paying for sports rights. You know, you look at Disney, they're paying upwards of $10 billion just for all of the sports rights that they have. So I think relatively, it's it's a way for them to kind of experiment, test the waters, see how it plays out. And then remember, on that 10-year deal with TKO, they do have a, an option after five years to kind of walk away uh, from the deal if, if they're not happy with, with how it's playing out for them. But still, I mean, for TKO, like it's kind of double what they were getting. Um, with regular cable. So how much is the content spend concern worth to the share price of Netflix? Oh, definitely. Content spend, I think, is definitely going to be one of those, uh, you know, worrisome factors for Netflix. But having said that, OK, so they did they are they, or they have said that they're going to spend 17 billion dollars this year on content. Obviously, it's probably going to go up to about 20 billion dollars over the next couple of years. But then look at their free cash flow profile. They're throwing out six and a half billion dollars in free cash flow in 2023. That probably goes to about 10 billion dollars in the next few years. So they do have a lot of cash at their disposal. They, they did say that they're going to buy back 
back shares, but we also want to see them invest in their business. And so this is a great way that they're investing in their business. Ultimately, I think to build up their advertising business, it's not just content, they're going to have to invest in their tech stack, in their ad tech stack a little bit more, uh, you know, to kind of uh, really get uh, more traction and more scale. All right, Keith, let's step back a little bit on the streaming business here. You just, you know, threw out some big, big free cash flow numbers, which, boy, I remember the days when they had negative free cash flow and they were just trying to get some, uh, get the positive free cash flow. How about the other competitors out there? What's the feeling that we're, you know, two, three, four years into this whole streaming business here? Is there room for other players here? How do you think this might shake out? Yeah, uh, Paul, I, I think, you know, the streaming wars are definitely over at this point, And we know the winner is, is Netflix. Um, you know, they've just completely decimated the competition, if you will, whether it's in terms of subscriber growth, but more importantly, you know, subscriber growth doesn't really, it, it's, it's important, but it's not, it's not the be all and the end all uh, what, what, you know, the street is really focused now on is, is the financial side of things is the profitability metrics and Netflix has kind of absolutely blown it out of the park. And so as we kind of look at, you know, we're really, what we're kind of trying to see is the margin profile. So right now, if you look at Netflix's streaming business, it's a 20% operating margin, but they have committed to about 300 basis points of average annual increase. So just push that out another three, four years. Very soon, we could be seeing upwards of 30% operating margins. Can any of the other players like a Disney, like a Warner Brothers Discovery replicate that? They did. They did have those margins in their cable TV business. Unfortunately, in the streaming business, it's going to be a really, really long haul. We do think that they could potentially maybe get to, you know, 10 percent, 15 percent, but it's going to take them a, a very, very long time. And who knows how the whole landscape is going to shift by that time. Paul, how do you watch stuff? Uh, kind of, you know, the only stuff I watch really is sports. OK. Uh, and then I will stream some stuff. You know. But but will you do you still have traditional cable yes. then to watch the sports? Yes, for the broadband and mm -hmm. for the sports. Okay. But but if you can get sports on streaming, would you cut the cord? Well, I need broadband access. Oh, well, sure. So, yeah. But you can so, get that just that. Yeah, that's right. And that, that that's basically what it, what it would be. And Geetha, the cord cutting I was going to Alex's question, where are we there in terms of cord cutting? It's bad. It's really <laughs> bad, Paul. If Paul's um, even talking oh. the words, that I feels know. bad. <laughs> It's it's close to an eight to nine percent erosion. And just to kind of give you some context here, you know, back in the day, Paul, when when you were kind of covering the space very actively, it was 104 million pay TV yep. households. Right now, we're down to about 70 million. Um, wow. And the the you know, and kind of the outlook is we're probably going to go to 50 million in the next couple of years. Wow. And then who knows who knows where that's where tough, we're headed after that. That's a tough business. All right, Geetha, thank you so much for joining us. Always feel a little bit smarter after checking in with you, Geetha Ranganathan. She covers all the. TMT space for Bloomberg Intelligence. He's based in our uh, headquarters in Princeton, New Jersey, joining us via Zoom. And that is a tough, tough erosion to what was a phenomenal business model. When every household was paying its 80 or $90 a month, everybody in Hollywood was making money. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Last year, thanks to the rally at the end of the year, fixed income folks actually had some positive total returns there. Good year because 2022 is just ugly here. So it's been tough space in fixed income. Let's get the latest outlook here. We can do that with Natalie Trevithick, head of investment grade credit strategy at Payton and Regal. So Natalie, you guys rallied. I'm going to say you guys being the fixed income folks kind of rallied there in November, December, got some positive returns. Uh, how are you approaching 2024? Yeah, that was a sharp rally and maybe it went a little bit too far bringing uh, forward some of 2024 returns. But despite the modestly negative returns year to date, investor appetite for corporate bonds is insatiable. We've already had over 100 billion, 150 billion of supply this year, and most deals are over five times subscribed. Wow. So there's just so much investor money trying to get invested in corporate bonds at these higher yields, despite the small rise in interest rates since the beginning of the year. So then what happens when the Fed actually cuts? Yeah, if the Fed cuts, that's just even better news for corporate bonds, since we think, you know, there may be some potential widening in spreads, but that'd be offset by the move lower in interest rates. And even though the market's still pricing in a number of cuts this year, five to six, we think they may come a little bit later than anticipated, or maybe in the second half, because the economy is still looking strong. So, I mean, what's the market like? Are you just like when the phone 
Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, or whatever calls you guys to buy a new issue, do you just buy it? Are people just buying these things, or do they saying, "Oh no, um, this is the maturity I want. This is the uh, this is the sector I want." Or are they just kind of clamoring to get anything? They're clamoring to get most things. There's been a ton of bank issuance, and you know, people were afraid to touch banks for a while last year. They rallied sharply, and people can't get enough of them. We've had some of the big banks price five billion dollar deals, and there's twenty billion of demand for them. So people are going after that, but they also want duration. So we haven't seen a lot of thirty year issuance, and whenever there's a thirty year deal, people just want to lock in these higher yields for longer. Whereas issuers, you know, they rather uh, borrow on the front end and not have these long term high interest. Cost. So if I'm a banker, I'm telling my issuers, we can go super covenant light, covey light, as we used to say back in the day. What, what is that? Are you guys so, are the buyers just so uh, aggressive that they will maybe give on some covenants and things like that? Yeah, it's getting to be that way in the high yield market. We're seeing less covenants. Uh, generally in investment grade corporate bonds, we don't have many to begin with. So uh, we're, we're used <laughs> right. to playing that game, but uh, they are pushing spreads you know, to the brink. <laughs> well, I have to, I have to be honest, guys. I'm normally risk averse anyway, but this makes me nervous. <laughs> you have covenants sort of going by the wayside, massive issuance, still massive demand from what you're saying seems a little bit indiscriminate. Um, what's the risk potential here then? Yeah, the risk would really be if we had a downturn in the economy, uh, then banks would underperform. They're very much a beta for the market, but we, you know, we do expect some volatility. We think spreads have come a long way. They ended last year 30 basis points tighter and they're tighter even this year, uh, despite those negative yields. So we think there could be some near term volatility and you see those negative uh, returns over the short term. But with a five and a quarter percent, you know, average coupon on a new investment grade credit, we think over the longer term, you're going to clip that nice coupon and maybe get a little bonus if the Fed cut. So we're looking at mid to high single digit returns in investment grade corporate this year. Wow. So are, are, are there sectors that you guys prefer these days in the credit space? Yeah, we've actually started to like the REIT sector now that uh, interest rates are off the high. We think that has room to perform and there's still a strong labor market. You know, we like some of the residential REITs, maybe staying away from some of the office REITs. Uh, we continue to be selective in the energy sector. Uh, there's been some attractive deals coming in that market, particularly within high yield, which we find compelling. And then banks are being pretty selective. Uh, we're looking for some of the banks which are coming at a, a little bit of a concession, but those have been pretty, pretty aggressively now. So uh, it's really deal specific there. Um, Natalie, I'm, I'm also wondering when you mentioned that, like, if, if we see a downturn, that that would provide some rough volatility for the sector. What kind of downturn, like softness versus like a deep recession? Like what happens if we just kind of have middling growth, for example? Yeah, we're expecting that soft landing and maybe some middling growth. And that's almost a Goldilocks scenario for corporate bonds since there's no real reason for them to widen. And you still have investors looking for that extra 100 basis points by going into corporate bonds over just treasuries. So you kind of hang out there and you get that coupon clipping year. You know, obviously, if it's a harder recession and it's unexpected, you could see spreads, you know, blow out materially wider. But what we've seen is investors tend to step in when we got that volati volatility last year after the banking crisis. When spreads got to 165, there's a strong buyer base came back in and pulled spreads back in as we recovered. So when you talk to issuers here, are they raising money because they can, because they have to, because, hmm. boy, they could have raised money a lot cheaper a couple of years ago. And uh, why are companies coming to the market here, given that rates relative to the last several years are, are in fact higher? Yeah, so corporate bonds tend to, these uh, companies tend to issue, you know, once a year, some of them multiple times a year, like the banks almost come every quarter. So it's just refinancing their existing debt is a lot of it, general corporate purposes. Some of it's for share buybacks, but you kind of hit the nail on the head is that they refinance a lot of their debt a few years ago, particularly in 30 year bonds. So they have a lot of duration out there already that they have at very low coupon payments. So now they're looking more at the front end mm -hmm. and just continuing their normal boring schedule. It's actually interesting that the average coupon has only gone up about 50 basis points from the lows it hit last year. So it's only about four, you know, four and a, four and a quarter percent now. So it's not like they're refunding their entire debt stock each year. So any kind of like massive wall of maturity that we've been worried about over the last two years that will come due and rates aren't going to be uh, from the Fed at zero. That's not a thing. 
that's really not a thing in investment grade bonds, because as I mentioned, uh, companies have termed out their debt issuing 20, 30, 40 year bonds. So there's no looming wall there. And high yield companies have had great access to the market. Supply has been a little bit light there. And there's a lot of private debt financing uh, t in, in that market. So we really don't see a big maturity wall looming in the next few years. Hmm. Natalie, do you guys have paid in Regal? Do you stay domestic U.S. or will you look at international issuers? Uh, we'll look at international issuers as well. We have a, a great emerging markets team here. And so what's 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 kind of the view from for you guys for emerging markets and, and just, you know, paper outside the U.S.? Yeah, we think there's definitely opportunities in emerging markets. I'm going to defer to, the, to their team to give you the countries, but we think it could be a solid growth year um, for EM. All right, Natalie, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Natalie Trevithick, Head of Investment Grade Credit Strategies, Payton and Regal here. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. When we have Bobby Goshen here, we talk geopolitics, Middle East, what's going on there. Mm hmm now he's got a column out on awards shows. So I go to read it, and then I go see, oh, it's Bobby Ghosh is Bloomberg Opinion columnist covering culture. Previously, he covered foreign affairs. That's a pivot. Who makes that pivot from foreign affairs to, like, culture? To Barbie. It's a Barbie. I don't know. How do you feel about that, Bobby? Uh, about Barbie, not very much. I, you know, everyone's going to be talking about Barbie being yes. snubbed for a, a couple of categories. I'm going to be the oddball who says, I'm glad to hear it. I, I hated the movie. Oh, oh, I absolutely boy. hated Whoa. the movie, and I'm glad. Sarah, I'm just going to step back and let these two go <laughs> at it. Okay, well, first of all, I yes. guess it's not made for you. But do you I know women so. of my age group that didn't like it or did like my, it? My wife loves it. Uh, I know plenty of people, women and men, who loved it. Okay, I okay. just didn't like it. I okay. thought it was too loud and too tacky and too exploitative. And basically, you know, it was a marketing campaign for a doll. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. so. I didn't get it. I'm too cynical. You yes, see, when you cover foreign, foreign affairs, affairs right. long uh, enough, okay. you become deeply, deeply cynical. And, but I don't you know, disagree that, in, yeah. in essence, it's still an ad for Mattel Barbie, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. But to me, that didn't take away from the brilliance of the script and the message <laughs> that comes across uh, for it. I weep every single Nyad. time in the same for spot. For that, Nyad. Uh, nominations for Annette Benning. That was a terrific movie. You want, you want a message about women empowerment, if that's what you're looking for, that's a fantastic movie. You right. know, what I can also do is just watch Barbie that I bought it. So I'm just going to buy it. I, I mean, I bought it and I'll just watch that. <laughs> watch but anyway, this is not what your column is about. Yeah, no. Your column says award shows like the Oscars are doomed. I, I feel like I've heard this one before. Yeah, so, you know, all the award shows, Oscars, Emmys, uh, Golden Globes, uh, the, the audiences have been dropping precipitously over the past decade. It used to be that an Oscar night would be 40 million uh, viewers, and then it became about 30s. Now it's down to, you know, if they get 10, 12, then they're lucky. Last year, there was a little bit of an uptick. I think a lot of people uh, sort of basically dialed in to see if there'd be a repeat of Will Smith's <laughs> slap on uh, sure. Chris Rock. There wasn't a slap. This year, ironically, the nominations are going to get a lot of buzz for the reasons we've just been talking about, because uh, Margot Robbie gets snubbed because Greta Gerwig gets snubbed. There'll be a lot of buzz around the nominations, but for those exact same reasons, I suspect fewer people will watch the actual mm -hmm. Oscars. It's too long. It's, uh, you, you know, there's just too much uh, uh, sort of pomp and circumstance and very little actual content. And most people will, will consume the highlights on uh, YouTube and on TikTok. On, on, That's not know, what the ABC media. Television Network wants to hear. That's, I mean, because they, I yeah. mean, that's it, historically these events, which uh, uh, the CEO, former CEO of CBS would call, oh, wow, uh, events. Mm. That's what brings in huge advertising dollars. So, well, that's so, just another emblematic of the overall issue of TV cord cutting. and so Yeah, on. Th they'll sell out the ads. They sold out the ads the last time as well, last year as well, but at a lower rate. Mm -hmm. So that's something that they need to worry about. If they, they you know, sufficient numbers of people will tune in that advertisers will still remain interested in uh, the event, but for progressively or, you know, smaller and smaller amounts of and money. And here goes this. This is the sales pitch that broadcast and cable television have been making to Madison Avenue for 30 years. Yeah. Okay, here's the pitch. I'm ready. I'm going to give you an inferior product to what I gave you last year. I'm going to charge you more. That's not going this way anymore, And it though. works every single year. Wait, so th they're charging more for this space right now? Every year, up until the last couple of years when cord cutting became so bad, but broadcast and cable television, which say, yeah, I know my ratings are down because there's 500 more more channels. 
But still, I have the biggest audience at CBS. Yes, it's half of what it was 10 years ago, but it's still bigger than anything else out there. Oh, by the way, for that, I'm going to charge another 5, 6, 7, 8%. And that worked forever. Now the issue is... Yeah, I don't think that can be sustained for very we'll much see. longer. We'll see. I don't know. Yeah, I think, again, you know... If Unless they, you're the Super Bowl. If you're the Super Bowl, you can go out and sports say... Sports is a different category. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sports... If, if you're a fan, you don't want to just watch the highlights. You want to watch the, the live performance. But with Oscars, with any award show, more and more people are quite happy just to see the highlights immediately after yeah. the award yeah. is announced. They well, don't want to watch the whole... Uh, you awkward know, the, moments. The awkward moments, the songs, the skits. Uh, you know, it, it seems like too much of a that used to be That used to be must-watch It television. Really, I know. It I, goes I, to John Tucker's, the whole world's coming to an end. Well, yeah. I would have Oscar parties. Literally, we'd like do boats. We'd put in money. We'd like people walk home with a couple hundred bucks. Like It was, it was like can a Can you bet on the I guess you can. Like, At, with probably. people in my home? Sure. Right. I mean, oh, like in, in the reality of the right, world? Maybe I might be into it. Then. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but what I also wonder, too, is... Do you think that these kind of live events will go the way of sports in different ways of viewing it? Like we saw WWE and Netflix, for example. Yeah. Like, would Paramount be like, hey, let's just air it streaming and, and, and save some, like, is that a thing? Well, I think you probably, if the audience continues to shrink, they'll have to find new mm -hmm. ways of making it relevant. I, you know, in, in, in time, I think you'll see the duration of it shrink. I don't think a three and a half hour program, which invariably goes closer to four hours, I don't think that's sustainable anymore. This year, they're bringing it forward. They're starting broadcast an hour early because they're conscious that in that last hour, past bedtime in uh, the East Coast, a lot of people, the next day is a school day, lots of people just switch off. And that's a real problem for them. So they're bringing it forward to try and see if they can sort of juice the audience that way. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'll probably see a certain amount of stunt casting in... in uh, in the in the people who are hosts or presenters, we've seen that happen in the in the Olympics, for instance. You know, Olympic audiences have been down. NBC has been bringing in people like Snoop Dogg to right. <laughs> to, to try and get audiences interested. I, I I say okay, let's have a let's have a a switch and get some Olympic performers to present the Oscars. I'll watch Simone Biles well, present ABC the Oscars. Doesn't oh, have the I totally ABC watch doesn't them. have the rights to the Olympics. So you're not that's true, but that. you can bring uh, an athlete in. So, yep, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. I mean, uh, you're bringing in ath athletes to just some stunt hosting. As you, as yeah, you I think you'll, you'll see presenters. progressively more and more desperate attempts to try and hold on to that audience, but I think that ship has sailed. Um, what else are you working on right now? What else catches your eye? Well, the culture is a very, very sort of large... Yeah, yeah. Beat and there's a big tent, and there are lots of different aspects to it. I'm, I'm sort of taking a nibble of the food, uh, some food stuff, uh, no pun intended. <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying to wrap my head around uh, the 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 evolution of the entertainment business. The, yep. Just this this fact that it's it's becoming more and more sort of desegregated and, and you can't rely on the old no. uh, tentpole events and on the old ways of watching and consuming entertainment. People are watching entire movies in segments on TikTok. That just, yep. you know, my head explodes at the thought of that. Can you watch an entire movie two minutes at a time? But people are doing that. I've written about that mm. in the past and that's very interesting to me. You know, just to, to sort of uh, come back to the Oscars, that slap that we were talking about. Yep. Mm -hmm. Within 24 hours of that slap, 50 million people had watched it on YouTube. It broke the, the existing YouTube record. 50 million people. How many people watched it on ABC? 12 yep. million people. Hmm. So, have we become you know, less cultured? I don't think we're less cultured, but certainly... I want, you to, come want, you, to I yes. want you to come up with an index, <laughs> like the Dow or the S&P 5, uh -huh. the culture index. <laughs> okay. I don't know what components will go into it. Telling us, you know, are we less or more cultured? I think our attention span has certainly uh, been greatly reduced because, in part, because there's just so much competing for our attention, and and the and Hollywood and and uh, the 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 theaters have been taking for granted for years that we will go in and watch uh, a movie, you know two and a half hours at a stretch. In the case of some of this year's big three. blockbusters, three and a half hours at a yeah. stretch. But I think fewer and fewer people are gonna do that. That's just too long. It is, I mean, it's, it's uh, that's what I think the big issue is. And you talk to the filmmakers in Hollywood and they're frustrated like crazy because they, you know, they, they feel like the art form of, of cinema yeah. is dying. Um, and so, but then you get Martin Scorsese, who I think goes the other extreme with his film that's because he's martin Scorsese. Yeah. that's right and, and, and i, I walked Nolan. out of the theater saying yeah, yeah 
Martin Scorsese took me for granted. Yeah. He made a three and a half hour movie when it very well could have been a two hour movie. Mm -hmm. I Absolutely. love the movie, I love the actors, but I did not have a good experience. And if I saw him on the street right then, I said, did not. But so have did a good Christopher experience. Nolan. Oppenheimer was like 17 yeah. hours. I know. Yeah. It didn't happen. Not really. The thing, interesting thing though, that here's the, that here's the weird thing. We're, wa we're perfectly happy to spend an entire day binge watching yes. a TV series. Yes. Yep. So, uh, you know, eight hours, nine hours at a stretch, just breaking for lunch and, uh, and bathroom breaks. <laughs> But we don't want to watch three and a half hours in, in the cinema. Yeah. So, you know, Hollywood has to wrap its head around that. So, what, so, so why is that? Is that what John Tucker's saying, that we're all just getting dumber? I think, <laughs> no, I don't think we're getting dumber. I think some stories are better told in the long format. This long, this idea of binge watching is relatively new. Mm -hmm. this, the, the, the opportunity didn't exist before. And I think a lot of really intelligent directors are taking to that, recognizing that that's how, that's where we live now. That's where there is appetite now. And if that means that we make fewer movies and more uh, interesting, long-running television shows, then so be it. I just think that people can spend, you get on your Instagram reels, you look down, you look up, it's three hours later. Yeah, well, there's that a rabbit hole. That is out really? of control. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. for somebody who, who I'm sensitive to that stuff, I don't want to get anywhere near that. It happens. And so imagine if you're sitting in Hollywood and you're like, wait a minute, this knucklehead just got entertained rapidly for three hours on user-generated content and just garbage. What happened to the $200 million movie I just made? You know, huh. that's kind of the big issue. Bobby Ghosh, we're talking more about, about this uh, with Bobby Ghosh. You just made John Tucker cry. I know, it's just, but he's got, he feels, he feels passionately about this uh, whole dumbing down of America, and uh, there's a lot of data to support it, quite frankly. So, Bobby Ghosh, thanks so much uh, for joining us here. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Let's check in with uh, Brooke Suttle and why? Well, she's very nice. We like talking to Brooke. And she's super duper smart. And she really covers uh, all of these industrial companies well. And there's a lot of stuff to talk about here. So Brooke Sutherland, uh, she writes for Bloomberg Opinion. She's based up in Boston. Hey, Brooke, I don't know where you want to go here. We've got the, you know, the 3M issue. We got the GE uh, earnings. Let's start with those companies, which are, you know, right in your ballywick in terms of industrial America. What do we take away here? Sure. I mean, I think um, there are two different stories here. So, I mean, GE sits uh, primarily it, its crown jewel is the aerospace business, which will stand alone come April once it feeds, completes sort of that final piece of its slow moving breakup. This is a very strong um, corner of the industrial market, particularly for companies like GE that provide maintenance services, um, repairs. That business has been booming because we've had so many issues um, with Boeing and Airbus in terms of being able to deliver jets. So it's kept airlines flying older planes for longer. Um, older planes need more shop visits. They need more repairs. Um, and so companies like GE have just been really growing like crazy there. And that looks set to continue given Boeing's continued challenges and then also the recall of the geared turbofan jet engines, which is impacting a big portion of the Airbus A320 uh, fleet. Um, and so that business is really doing quite well. And I think GE is just kind of chugging along here. I think the stock reaction that you're seeing um, reflects the fact that this company, the shares have really just taken off like yeah. a rocket ship over the past 12 months um, on enthusiasm about this breakup. Um, and maybe, you know, investors got a little bit ahead of themselves in terms of the forecast. But this is also a company that has a history of, of setting the bar um, at a beatable level under Larry Culp. Um, at 3M, it's a completely different story. They play more in sort of the, the shorter cycle industrial markets, places with quick sales turnarounds. And so they've really been hit hard by slowdowns in electronics um, and uh, in China as well. Um, and, you know, that sort of general inventory destocking phenomenon that's haunted much of the industrial sector um, over the course of the back half of 2023. And I think, you know, as you look at the forecast that they gave for this year, there's nothing heroic here. Um, we're talking about pretty pedestrian sales growth um, going forward. And I think, you know, there was some hope that maybe we might start to see some green shoots that, you know, this corner of the industrial world might start to turn around if, if for no other reason than, you know, the ISM has been in contraction territory for 14 months now, which is the longest streak since the dot-com bubble burst. And at some point that has to end, but it doesn't appear that we've reached that point just yet. 
talking about 3M before and just talking about, hey, wasn't this the whole point of a conglomerate that like you have all these different parts, you have uh, industrial demand, you have retail demand, you have China demand, you have electronics demand, and then that's going to spare you all the pain. But it seems like everything is not doing well. It, I mean, it. 3M always makes the argument that their businesses stick together because of material science. Um, when you think about, they sell automotive adhesives and then also post-its, but at the end of the day, it's still, still an adhesive. adhesive and there's a it's lot of glue. overlap there. Um, but where that is really make breaking down is that they were supposed to have this, you know, um, superhuman R&D engine that would just keep churning out better and better products and, and help push the growth of the company along. And we're just not seeing that in the results. And the company has been in restructuring mode um, for years now, quite frankly, and then also dealing with, you know, the, the very serious legal liabilities related to PFAS um, and military earplugs. And so it, it's a company that is trying really hard to reinvent itself and get back to focusing on actually making industrial products. But that's just not the story right now. So I mean, are we, is he taking a victory lap here? Because he's really done a good job, it seems like, just looking at the stock. Yeah, I mean, he should be. This was a certainly not an easy task that he inherited. Um, it was some pretty dark days when he took over as CEO of yep. GE. Um, and I think there are a lot of lessons here um, from what he's been able to do as we think about what Boeing needs to do to right the ship over there. There was a lot of... Hmm shared executives between those two companies. And I think um, some similarities between their two cultures and GE has done sort of a really top to bottom overhaul of the way that it operates. Um, and that extends, you know, not just to the boardroom, but to the factory floor. And Larry Culp's been very hands on. Um, and he's a big believer in lean manufacturing. And, and that is a philosophy that is rooted first and foremost in safety um, and uh, quality and on time deliveries, which are things that, you know, Boeing, really could use um, some lessons on. Yeah, said so nicely because it's growth. <laughs> um, so I'm looking through the different areas. We talked a lot about aerospace. For GE, you know I'm going to be interested in the energy part, and that's what really the spinoff is going to be. I have to say, though, like not terrible. Like the renewable energy revenue uh, up 23%, power revenue up 15%. Um, there was still an operating loss, though, in renewable energy. What? Where's the weakest link there? Yeah, no, it's definitely not terrible. Um, and this business has come a really long way. Um, and, you know, I think it's gotten to the point where it is at least stable um, and that it, it's realistic to have a conversation about what this looks like on its own, which was certainly not the case um, for, for a very long time. Um, they're still struggling a bit in offshore, but they, you know, have been able to eke out some profits in, in onshore and in grid, which is really, you know, helping to, to Put this business in a much stronger place so they're not out of the woods completely just yet um but they've really come a long way and, and to be talking about positive free cash flow um i mean that blows my mind a little bit as i remember the the <laughs> totally. dark old days when we were coming out of the you know disastrous alstom acquisition and this business was just uh, on the gas turbine side was just bleeding money um and so you know this this has really been a stark turnaround and and the business is in a much better position especially when you think about siemens energy yes. um, which is probably the closest peer and just all of the issues that they have had um, which also stems from quality control. And I just, I do not think it is a coincidence that GE under Larry Culp with all of his focus on lean manufacturing has avoided the major quality control lapses that we've seen at Siemens Energy, at RTX, at Boeing. Um, it, I think the company is just a lot more on top of it and that's a reflection of his approach. So it's wind, so it's all about energy. It's the big wind turbines. Yes, yeah. yeah. Often, so somewhere off of New Jersey, I, I think, think they were so. supposed to be. I think so. and, then, and then Orsted didn't like that well, so John much. Oh, that's, and, a, that's the proposal, I believe it's gone through they're still doing i think environmental impacts uh, no but the, but the companies uh, they want more money because yeah. prices have gone up so much and the contract isn't giving them the money and so they're kind of pulling out and writing down their stuff seeing those big turbines off my deck <laughs> we got bigger issues in new jersey hey sure, brooke um <laughs> let's switch gears a little bit about boeing i'm seeing that the uh, recently the united airlines chief executive scott kirby criticized boeing on tuesday saying he was disappointed with what he called the plane maker's sluggish response to the grounding of MAX 9 aircraft. What's the latest from our good friends at, at Boeing? Uh, the, I mean, the latest is that that MAX 9 variant that was involved in the Alaska Airlines incident remains on the ground, um, and the FAA is being very thorough. Um, they did complete sort of the, the first round of inspections on those 40 initial jets, and were downloading that data to see if that process was um, what it needed to be to get those jets back up into the air. But, I, I mean, I think... 
the frustration among uh, Boeing customers is palpable, not just from United, but we've also heard comments from Ryanair and a, a couple other customers because this is just not the first time that we've had manufacturing um, issues out of Boeing, um, nor is it the first time that deliveries have been delayed or, you know, a, a plane that Boeing had promised on a certain timeline gets significantly delayed. And I, I, I think if you're an airline customer, you just have to be you have to be frustrated. And yeah. I think that's just what we're seeing right now. Yeah, it's, it really is amazing. And the question is, where do you go? And it's a duopoly here. So I'm not sure where you go. Exactly. Uh, so, all right, Brooke, thanks so much for joining us. Brooke Sutherland, she's a Bloomberg Opinion columnist. She covers all the industrial uh, parts of this economy. So it's great to check in with Brooke on a day when you've got 3M reporting, you've got GE reporting. United actually had some good numbers. That stock uh, is higher. There's still some issues ongoing with Boeing. And I read a piece, you know, recently, opinion piece where it just kind of said, Boeing, you know, they made a decision, maybe a good decade plus to focus a little bit more on profitability, total yep. returns, um, at maybe at the expense, maybe at the expense of some of their engineering uh, investments.